Good morning to you and thank you so much for keeping it NBS Television. My name is Mildred Tohaise and this is the topical discussion. As Alia said, our conversation will rotate around the private sector, its growth, the challenges, the opportunities therein, but also not forgetting the fact that government did set out a private sector development uh, plan, initiative and action uh, points to see how it can get to bolster the private sector. For example, looking at some of the program results that it intended to achieve after the five years and also going through the National Development Plan uh, Phase 3, they, reduced, uh, they looked at reducing the informal sector from 51% that was in 2018-19 to about 45% in 2024-25. Now, this is that very financial year. They were also looking at uh, reducing, uh, um, increasing, I beg your pardon, the non-commercial lending to private sector in key growth areas uh, or sectors from about 1.5% in 2018-19 to 3% of the GDP. And one other out of the very many was looking at increasing the value of exports from about 3,450 million US dollars in 2017-18 to 4,973 million. But also not forgetting increasing the proportion of uh, public contracts and subcontracts that are awarded to local firms from 30 to 80%. The question is, how far are we, especially that we are in the very financial year where this program will be coming to an end and then we'll be delving into um, a, a re-evaluation. The, the concern or the question or the say has always been, Uganda is a private sector-led economy. Is that being felt? Is the government doing their fair share? That is why I will be joined by two experts to be able to bring this conversation to fruition. I always say ladies first unless when there is danger. So I will turn to my left and welcome uh, uh, welcome Jen Alunga, who is the executive director of Seattle Jen. It's always a pleasure having you and good morning. Good morning, Mildred. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much. And good morning, our viewers. I also can't wait to delve into a sector that you also are part of. Yes, <laughs> we are passionate about. Uh, very, very passionate. And also I do have uh, Mr. Patrick Katabaz, who is a lawyer, but also an economist uh, and also in the private sector. So it's definitely a private sector <laughs> conversation. Patrick, yes. good morning, a pleasure having you. Uh, yes, good morning, Mildred, and uh, good morning to our viewers. Okay, we'll be delving deeper into this whole conversation. And I'll start with Jen. Is it a facade? Is it a reality? Is it being uh, put in action when we continuously highlight for the good or for whatever reasons? Uganda is a private sector-led economy and government is here to support. What comes to your mind when that statement is said? Uh, you see that the statement of uh, we are private sector-led, mm. private sector development, we need to understand the history, where it came from. And it was a package given to us by IMF World Bank mm. and other structured adjustment programs, where World Bank told us that if you are to grow your economies, you have to privatize, mm. Mm. You let government get out of development, oh. <clears throat> you have to liberalize, you know, liberalize open up your economy mm. so it was a package uh, of policies which today are being questioned whether they are really right because by the way when you look at uh, the developed countries they told us private sector led and they told our government to let to have just Take a back to, seat. A back seat, just to level the ground, to ensure that there is a, a conducive environment. But when you look at the, the, the developed countries and how they developed, they didn't do that. And when we talk about here private sector led, we need to look at the reality of our private sector. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the private sector, we need to, to separate the foreign private sector oh, yeah. and oh, yeah. the national private sector. The because believe you me, the international, the transnational, the foreign in private sector will never develop your country. <laughs> they come in, they extract, they take out. So when we talk about private sector led, we need to look at the reality. And we need to be clear what 
how do we divide the development roles? What should government do? Because our private sector really needs nurturing. It's the indigenous a, private the, sector. Yeah, it needs nurturing. If we are to give it that huge role, of leading our development and our economy. Mm. And we, devolve, we will go into that. But we need to look at the reality of our private sector, their MSMEs, you know, small businesses. It's the greatest percentage, yeah. They are for survival for today with very high mortality rate. So we need to look at that reality. And also look at if we want to develop, where do we want to go? So how do we ensure we nurture this private sector to be able to do what we want it to do? Okay, thank you very much. I'll definitely be delving into that. And you raise a very important point of getting to segregate between the foreign private sector and the indigenous private sector. Uh, to you, Patrick, um, is, is this a word or a statement that excites you as someone in the private sector that all oh, Uganda is a private sector led economy and that is what government entirely talks about with whatever development plans in ensuring that the private sector thrives. Is it a reality? Uh, yes, it's a question of yes and no. And no. Uh, because quite frankly, Uganda is a developing country and as such, uh, its aspiration to have a private sector led economy I think, in my view, is work in progress. We need to give it proper context. Uh, for example, we now know that uh, over 65% uh, contribution to our GDP comes from Kampala metropolitan area, mm. meaning that the 35% uh, contribution comes from outside the Kampala area. If you reduce uh, the contribution of other urban centers across the country, you realize that uh, more or less like 30% uh, is what might be coming from our, our rural communities. So sometimes when we are talking about economic growth and we talk about economic stability, that the fundamentals of our economy are doing very well, many times we are talking about a very good picture, but which resonates with very, very few people or very, very few economic players. Because like you have, you have heard, most of the economic players are really centered around urban centers. Mm. So that very extent then, you might find that our debate about private sector led economy is something that does not touch on the majority of the Ugandans. My majority of the Ugandans might possibly have, uh, have a different view. But I must again say that government has taken very many initiatives aimed at uh, ensuring that the private sector uh, thrives you, you've heard of all these uh, policies that, that, that we have been talking about mm. uh, there, and then you're talking about capitalization, for example, of Uganda Development Bank. Uh, you, you have uh, many programs that are looking at uh, rebooting the informal sector, getting the informal sector to formalize the informal, formal sector. Projects such as GLOW, projects such as Special Development Model, uh, the development and um, sustainable approach towards uh, savings and credit cooperatives. So, so you have very many interventions that are at play. Some of the results from these interventions may not be realized today. They might take uh, some time. Mm -hmm. But I think the government is, is, is making an effort. Uh, in as far as the policy and regional framework uh, is concerned. What we are contending with again are the challenges that are coming from our own uh, economic, uh, macroeconomic setup, but also the others that are coming from without. And that's why uh, my colleague was talking about, yes, having an economy, yes, having private sector, yes, but again, this is dominated by uh, foreign the players. Foreign. For mm. example, you have banks, and, and you have very few indigenous banks, as an example, so meaning that most of the profits that are made uh, within the country get affected by what we know as, as capital of right. So all of that, of course, becomes part and parcel of the discussion. And, and for me, as, 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 as a country, having uh, foreign players in our economy is not necessarily a very, 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 very bad idea if they are acting as models for learning. Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. we are growing economy. There are certain things that we don't have that we could have and learn from and adopt but and, is that and, the reality and, and also on the other hand? So the reality is that this is either slow 
or non-existent in most cases. That's where the danger is, but ordinarily the concept wouldn't be a very bad one. Okay, thank you. Jen, coming back to you, and uh, on, on the separation, why do we need to? Because after all, when we are talking about contribution to the GDP, this separation doesn't come through. We don't say private, uh, you know, indigenous contributed this much, private um, foreign did contribute this much. Why is it very important to specifically segregate and pay attention to these two sections differently? Um, it is very important. Um, because when we look at growing an economy, you know, that's, it's a homegrown economy. You have to depend on your private sector because the FDI, the, they are investors. They will invest here, they invest in Kenya, they will invest in Brazil, they invest in India. If your, your economy is ailing, they move. They move, mm -hmm. and they, when they extract what um, Patrick has said, for example, when they extract, they take out, out of the economy. So you can't depend on them to grow your economy, but you, we need them. We need them because they have sometimes the capital, some, sometimes they don't have capital by the way, mm -hmm. but ideally, you know, they have mm -hmm. the capital, Sometimes they have the technology, they bring the jobs. So what's important is how do you use the investors to be able to grow your domestic private sector mm. and grow the economy. I will give you an example of our, our investment code. Mm? Because you know, Mildred, policies are very important. You know? I hear sometimes the way people talk, why don't investors do this? Mm -hmm. Did you ask them, you know, do you, because we have a saying in Seattle, if you want it, ink it, hmm? ink it, put it on paper, sign on it. So our, our investors, when you look at our, our, our investment code, it has no joint ventures, you know. So if an investor comes in, he's not obliged to have a joint venture mm, with a company, mm. with a, <clears throat> a private company. And this is one of the ways how we can be able to grow and nurture But, but, but our joint ventures sector. are provided for by law, but they're not uh, obligatory to say. Then let us make it obligatory. Let us, you know, there is what we call, um, uh, what we call agreement shifting, treaty shifting, treaty shopping. Private sector, FDI, they, 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 they shop, treaty shopping. For them, they will say, according to the investment code and according to the bilateral investment treaty, which I have signed between me, our country, in, uh, Britain, and, and Uganda, there is no joint ventures. So if we say that we want to use joint ventures as a vehicle to grow, our private sector, let us do that also. Mm. There is the issue of technology transfer. Again, in our bilateral investment treaties we sign with other countries, our investment code, it's not there. Issues around ring fencing. What, what sectors, what businesses should the foreign investors go to? What businesses should our private sector go into. I'll mm. give you an example. We have an investor who came to Uganda, Newman. They gave him land, they gave them land in Mubende to grow coffee. Why should you bring an investor to grow coffee, growing coffee? Probably because the indigenous people are not choosing to do that, even after the But, but we are, everybody is growing coffee. What you do, because you have brought an investor to compete with your small-scale producers, bring an investor, because this is a German investor. You have the technology. You are coming from Germany. You have the technology. You have the muscle, financial muscle, and you have the market. What do you do with such an investor? Do you tell them? You, do you give them land? Do you di displace people? Hmm? small-scale producers on that land, do you displace them to bring an investor to grow coffee? What you do, you tell that investor, set up a factory there, 
let these people, the small scale producers, give you the coffee. Give them the technology, mm? the skills to grow the coffee the you quality. want, mm. the quality you want. That means you are, you are nurturing your private sector because in between there, you are going to get nursery, nursery producers, people who are producing that coffee, mm. the seedlings. And that's how you deliberately grow the private sector, okay. grow the economy. But you have used that FDI, the foreign investor, to be able to grow yours, not to compete. And Mildred, we have seen this. Remember the, um, the, our traders, the Chikubo people. This is what they are saying. Yeah. A, 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 a Chinese investor comes. He's an investor. And but he's retailing. talking. You know? So, so we need to ensure that our policies bring face okay. for our private sector. Thank you. And, and, and Patrick, that's where I would want to bring you in. And um, Jen actually did highlight in the recent um, traders' strike, that has been one of the prominent issues of what we're doing is what the so-called investors are actually doing, the foreign persons. Um, has government failed at ring fencing or is it not an economically viable option to say we are ring fencing this particular one for the indigenous people? Well, I, I think most of the challenges that we have um, uh, in Uganda are basically about the perceptions that we have with the word investment. Okay. So who is an investor? Uh, many people believe that to be an investor, uh, you have to be foreign. Yet as a matter of fact, me and you are investors at various levels. And uh, the Uganda Investment Code does specify um, uh, people who, sh who are entitled to, 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 to incentives. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's very clear then who qualifies to be an investor in that particular sense. But that problem of perception I'm talking about is not only limited to me and you here. It actually in many cases also extends to government officers who are responsible for implementing of government policy. And in which case then we see that an investor who is at the same level with me will most likely get free land, and I won't get free land. More, more is likely get a tax holiday, and I won't get a tax holiday. I think for me that is where the differences are coming in. But by and large, there has to be a deliberate. I think the policies, in my view, we talked so much about policies, and in my view, the, the policies are, are there, all people know what to do. But, but maybe they will to do so. For example, now we already have uh, the Competitions Act of Uganda, mm. which is supposed to regulate market competition and create many multiple businesses, because you realize that you would have an investor uh, who then becomes a manufacturer, becomes a, a wholesaler, becomes a retailer, becomes a transporter, all in the same chain, you know. So then what happens to this other business person who would have wanted to be a, man, uh, uh, a retailer, who would have wanted to be a transporter, who would have wanted to be a wholesaler? So that kills so many businesses and so many jobs in between. Yeah. So, so the law is there, it needs to be implemented. Mm. So we've heard of the content, local content policies, mm -hmm. Uh, at play. Uh, and for me, issues of joint ownership, uh, issues of collaboration, in my view, then it comes into the local content. For example, if there is a job to construct a road, uh, in terms of employment, what is the local content there? In terms of ownership of the enterprise to do that activity, what is the composition of the local content? So, so for me, then, the, the competition law and the local content law would be very helpful in ensuring that we create, we strike that balance between... But, 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 but uh, Patrick, mm -hmm. do we get to do the initial assessment and discussions before? Because I'm thinking it's a good mm -hmm. one to talk about the Competition mm -hmm. Act. It's a good one to talk about local content. But I'm also thinking, have you first provided a ground to train and equip and get the skills into the local market so that when you're talking about a contract, it will be taken by a local person or a subcontract. 
It's one thing to want a local person to take the subcontract and another thing for the skills to be existent or you having imparted them. But yes, yes. So the, the, the training uh, has to be an ongoing exercise. And actually the reason why we're talking about local content here is in my view a realization that as a matter of fact we are lacking the country, the Ugandans um, are not so much present in the ongoing development initiatives and especially so in the business sector where most of the money is being taken away by non-Ugandans. It is mm -hmm. a realization. Mm -hmm. So now, even the interventions we are talking about are not 100% to say this should be 100% Ugandan. It means that Uganda should, a Ugandan should partner with their next part, with mm -hmm. an award-winning or a contract-winning expert. So Uganda tags, Ugandan tags along. A With Ugandan a very small percentage of tags ownership. along. In the very beginning, yes. And along the way, it, it is anticipated that uh, from that experience gained, people should be able to graduate. But also your question you asked, you, the question you asked, you asked is a very, very important one. For example, we do a number of roads in Uganda, and we have been doing roads since time immemorial. And we have school or faculty of engineering at Macri University, and other universities around. So you wonder why you would never get a, a, an indigenous company to, to basically do roads, yet we have, we produce graduates and graduates year in, year out. Mm. So, so the issue of capacity, the issue of confidence, the issue of capital, all of those play a very significant role in shaping who gets a contract and who executes it. So for me still, this local content dynamics that we are talking about should, in my view, be a stopgap measure. <coughs> Mm -hmm. to fill the gap that is existing. And once the gap is filled, this, it should be anticipated that going forward, or oh, many years or oh, hundreds of years to come, we should also be having uh, the experts of our own. For example, if, I have, if I'm a local engineer and I have worked mm -hmm. uh, prominently on a road yeah. for 20 years, then it should be me now, after 20 years, to take it, up to take it over. Entirely, yeah. Because I have the expertise, I have the knowledge. Maybe what I need then is capital. And that's why the issue of capital, in my view, especially in our, in our private sector, remains a very, very big uh, bottleneck. For example, uh, you know getting a loan in the bank is between 20 to 27% in Uganda right now. When you go to the countries that we compete with, uh, I can give an example maybe of, of Egypt, the African ones, the South African and others, you're talking about a range of 10, 10 to 12 percent. Mm. And of course, you know, if we are talking about foreign investors now, those who are ex extra foreign, I mean, those outside Africa, you are competing with a, country, a guy who's going to come from China who got a loan at 2 percent. In South Korea, 5 percent and others. So, 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 so for them, they are getting a loan at a very, very, very low cost. For you, you have the skill and the technical know-how. You have formed a company, but they want so much money, you can't even get it. Okay. And, and, and in my view, that again also undermines our private sector growth. The other thing that is also very prominent that we could also talk about alongside the local content and competition dynamics uh, is the issue of domestic areas. I, I, and, 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 I, and, and I think... For me, this is what is breaking the backbone of private sector in Uganda. Mm. As of now, it is estimated that we, uh, government of Uganda, owes the private sector Nine. eight Nine. trillion. Nine. That is more than ten percent. In fact, of, if they put in the budget, it was uh, nine trillion. Uh, of, uh, that is more than ten percent of our national mm. budget. Mm. I think now it has gone to eight trillion, as mm. my colleague Jenny is saying. And how much money is being budgeted every year for clearing of domestic areas? We are talking about 217, particularly for this financial, 217 billion, which is not even a percent, so to speak, of how much, of money. How much yeah. money is owed, especially for what we know and what has not yet been calculated into the stream. And what is happening in the commercial banks right now? Previously, it has been easier to borrow uh, from the bank to execute a contract. Now, going to the bank to borrow money on the account 
of the fact that you have a project with the government mm. is becoming refused. a red flag. Mm. They have refused that. Now banks are refusing. Mm. Because of the projects. delays in payment. Yes, yes because sure. of the delays in paying. Mm. And where is the big problem? The big problem is that for you, you are going to borrow money from the bank at an interest. We already said it is high. Mm. We already said it is 18.27%. But this government, which is not going to pay you, is never going to add interest on your payment when it finally pays. And, and some of these debts that we're talking about, that the government owes private sector, go beyond even five, five years. So ultimately, uh, it, it, it becomes very, very, very difficult okay. for private sector players who are working with government to even compete when these projects uh, which require uh, high levels of capital kick in. And, and, and that's why we cannot uh, discuss the issue of skill set, uh, technical know, uh, know how, uh, outside the, the entire framework yeah. uh, of, of the factors of production. Thank other you. factors of production. That Thank you. And, and, and actually, you mentioned very, uh, a very important point that is the monies that government has to be paying out to the private sector. And Jenna would ask, is government cannibalizing on the very private sector that is supposed to provide a conducive um, area for? Because I am thinking if you're holding up as much as nine trillion shillings, you're holding up money that should have been in circulation, but you're holding someone's capital as well. We even someone's profit in that business. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's very true. But, but what I want us to focus on, because those are symptoms of um, policies and systems which have gone wrong. Because if we don't address the underlying causes of why we are where we are, because that problem is going to continue. Mm -hmm. Remember the last uh, budget, it wasn't as much as that. It has gone on, it has continued uh, going up. And I don't see any, any prospects of how government is going to get that money. That's why they are rolling it over all the time. So, so we need to, uh, to look at why are we where we are? Why that situation? Because if we don't do that, the problem of the domestic areas, the, pro the problem, bigger problem of indebtedness of our country, the big problem of financing. Um, Patrick has raised the issue of borrowing. Our private sector is borrowing at a very high rate. Mm. Why are we where we are? We go back to the policy of where we liberalized even the financial sector. You know, we sold off our UCB, and I remember, I think it was um, <coughs> Dr. Suruma who raised mm. the issue <coughs> that unless we get our own, we grow our own banks, <coughs> our own banking sector, we never develop. Yeah. You can't run businesses without finances. And you can't run businesses when you are borrowing at that rate. And by the way, Patrick, Madrid, some of that business, that category, they are lucky that they are borrowing at maybe 20%. Mm -hmm. the, the rest of the people, mm -hmm. they are from microfinance. They are borrowing at a very high rate. They borrow today, you have to pay tomorrow. Coupled by the money lenders in the market. Exactly. You know, so, so we need to look at that. We need to, 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 to rethink our our, our financial sector. How? Let's actually we, start off with that. We need our bank. And I, I remember the president, they talked about it even in par parliament. Mm -hmm. We need UCB back. Some people will say they I will thought eat government them. is channeling that through the Uganda Development Bank and then. But where, where, where are they getting the money from? Because the, a bank is supposed to, 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 to collect money. Yeah. and be able to lend it, be able to, uh, to, to, to set policies that lend that money to agriculture at 0%. Can government do that? Because what government is doing now is to borrow even from the banks, the foreign banks here. And this is where we put our money. And for me, I <coughs> really feel so bad that I put my money, my money in a foreign bank 
and the government goes there to borrow that money at a very high rate. And we are paying, uh, we, are, we are repaying that debt. So government, when it has its own bank, it can be able to mobilize all this money from Madrid who doesn't do banking, but who says, my money, I put it there, mm. you know, and be able to lend it to Patrick at a determined rate. And this is how uh, uh, economies grow, because government will be able to channel money, be able to say, put that money at that rate in agriculture. Mm. But today, government is borrowing to own land, borrowing to own land. And that's why this is where we are. So we need to rethink our financial sector. Okay. We, liber we liberalized our capital account. Patrick was talking about capital flight. Money comes in, money goes, goes out. Up. Go to other countries, they will ask you, where are you taking the money? Because they have to keep the money internally. We have no, you know some people are saying incentives are bad, but it's the way you I handle that, you manage it. We need to put in place incentives to incentivize companies to be able to reinvest the profits they make. But today, profits go out, go out. So, so you can't run an economy which is like a leaking ba basket. Yeah? Money comes in, money goes out. So, so there is a lot, and for me what I think, you know, uh, the private sector uh, development program <coughs> should do is to rethink. Mm? We, 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 we should not continue parroting. We are private sector led. We liberalize. Mm. We, we are liberalized. We are liberalized. Yeah. We need to learn, you know, to learn from other economies. How did they do it? Okay. There is a book by Hajun Chan. Hajun Chang kicking away the ladder. Very good, you know, how did, uh, that's another book uh, by Eric, Professor Eric Reynard. Why poor countries are poor and why rich countries are rich. We need to understand what happened and what's going on. You know, instead of saying, uh -uh, we are private sector led, government is supposed to do this. But if you do things for so many donkey years and the economy is going down the drain, because we need to look at numbers. Sometimes we sit here and say, oh, Uganda is developing, but Uganda is an ODC, at least developing country. One of those countries at the bottom of the ladder. And we need to look at the reality that where we are, we are still exporting raw commodities, sure. coffee, maybe gold. I don't know about gold. Let me talk about coffee. Coffee, and the price is fluctuating every day. And we need to be able to sit and say, what happens today when Europe says, I, I think not we, are not, the we are not buying the coffee. What's going to happen? Today, EU, yesterday, we had, the other day we had a meeting, very big meeting, organized by us, UCDA was there. EU has told us that we need to do certain things hmm, to, show, to show them that we are not deforesting when we are growing our, mm. our <coughs> coffee. That directive, the deadline is December. 30th. 30th. Come Jan January, we don't know what, whether EU will be serious and say, if you, don't, you haven't done it, we are not buying your coffee. So we are there. Okay. Uh, then I'm asking myself, what if EU is really serious to say that if you haven't done what I have said, we are not buying your coffee? What's going to happen? But we are here very happy. You know? Good questions so, to be able to ponder upon. And, and also the issue now that actually comes through from your conversation is the aspect of planning. 
and, and how we plan and get to execute. But Jen and uh, Patrick, allow me to take a very short commercial break. And when we do return, we'll be looking at, we'll be opening the Book of Acts. Are there policy changes that need to be done? Um, is there something that we, as the private sector, also need to introspectively do to shift around um, the bargain and to shift what is currently happening? That and much more when we do return.